always a considerable and sometimes thankless task organizing a conference like this. I remember a conference years ago in Chicago when, in fact, it was the Saturday morning session, the organizers stood up in front of the room and said that they had a little problem that uh, one of the participants was in jail. And uh, they were informed by the Chicago Police Department that he would be taken to the, to the serious jail if they hadn't raised uh, several hundred dollars in bail funds uh, by that morning. And so they passed the hat around. To, so I, I hope the organizers here have not had such, uh, such problems. Um, what I want to talk about um, is uh, joint work uh, with Hélène Eno. Uh, am I in focus here? Um, was that a yes or a no? Any, any complaints from the back? Uh, the rights, yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Twisting the projector to the. Does that make it better or worse? Yeah. Better. No. Well, okay, we'll vote. Uh, anyway, this is joint work, um, and it concerns a sort of a variant uh, of the uh, original Chern-Simons uh, procedure. Uh, which is very, very, very algebraic uh, in character. Um, and basically uh, has to do, you recall, with the classical turn simons uh, construction, for example, for a flat uh, vector bundle, the classes you get uh, take values in C star. That is, there is a certain ambiguity, which is, uh, depending on how you normalize things, either integers or uh, 2 pi i times integers. Uh, and so you end up with C star valued classes. Um, and what we do is, um, based on the very, very rigid and uh, coarse uh, structure of the Zariski topology, there is another way to kill uh, that ambiguity, um, which concerns uh, killing differential forms you see, in the algebraic category, uh, it makes sense to talk about differential forms uh, being locally exact. Uh, in the context of the Poincaré uh, lemma, when you have when you're in a category, uh, for example, the classical topology, where the Poincaré lemma is true, uh, then it's a little stupid to talk about a differential form being locally exact, because you might as well just talk about it being closed. It's the same thing. Uh, but in the algebraic category, there's a difference, and one can exploit that difference to construct an interesting sort of uh, characteristic class uh, associated to uh, a vector bundle with a connection. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, these classes are related in an interesting way, in a rather subtle way, in a way we don't fully understand, to uh, algebraic cycles. Uh, which is no surprise because, of course, characteristic classes are related to algebraic cycles. But what becomes subtle is uh, precisely the strength of these algebraic cycles. Uh, uh, when one studies algebraic cycles, one studies them modulo various equivalence relations. And uh, somehow these turn simons classes seem somehow to, uh, to control uh, the precise uh, equivalence class of these algebraic uh, cycles, in particular something called the Griffiths group, which has long been an object of study, and they're very relevant for that. Uh, very much um, involved in this also is something called the Konevo spectral sequence. I'll speak more about these ideas in a minute. And then the second thing I want to talk about is a Riemann-Roch uh, theorem uh, for such classes, uh, which can be construed as a sort of an algebraic approach to work of Wismut uh, and Lot, although not necessarily, well, uh, Jean-Michel talked a little bit about uh, that in his talk, but, but it's not precisely the material he talked about last hour. So to begin with, uh, let me remark, uh, I feel a little bit like a, a fox in the hen house here. Uh, the things are, are a little different in the algebraic category. 
so let me remark that in the C infinity category, any vector bundle admits a connection. Right? And that's the first thing a differential geometer does on being presented with a vector bundle is that he or she puts a connection on it. Uh, in, the, in the algebraic category, uh, there's an obstruction. You, you, if, you have a, if you have a variety and you have a vector bundle, you say, okay, I want to put a connection, uh, an algebraic connection. That is, I want my, if you like, locally, I write down a connection matrix and I want the entries of that connection matrix to the algebraic functions. Sort of, uh, that's obstructed, it's something called the Atiyah class, uh, which is in H1. I don't have a pointer, I hope you can sort of follow along here. I also hate this idea of covering up half the slide, as though, you know, you're not grown up yet, you can't read the whole thing. Uh, but I hope if, if people lose where I am, just whistle and I'll point out. There's an obstruction, which is something called the Atiyah class, which is in H1 uh, with coefficients in the bundle of endomorphisms of the, of the vector bundle. Uh, tensor the sh omega 1, the sheaf of uh, algebraic 1 forms. Uh, and so it would seem that the whole theory is dead in the water before it even uh, leaves port. Uh, but actually there's a little trick, uh, which is that connections, the same observation you see, says that connections will exist uh, when the variety is affine. Because an affine variety, which is just a, an algebraic geometer's way to talk about a Stein variety, if you like, um, an affine variety has no uh, coherent sheaves on an affine variety have no higher cohomology, so that obstruction will vanish. And I mean, that is, e is the obstruction. And so that will vanish, and so there will be uh, connections. And you couple that with the idea um, that there exists, given any quasi projective rather general uh, algebraic variety, you can find a covering, uh, perhaps covering a vibration, uh, pi there. You see I have x tilde mapping to x, which is, an, and be careful here, I use the word affine in two different ways, but I, I, I don't know any other words. It's an affine bundle. That means that the fibers of pi, sort of locally pi, x tilde looks like x cross cn for some suitable n. So it's an, it's an affine bundle, which means that, well, an algebraic geometer would say the motive of x tilde, uh, a differential geometer might prefer to talk about the topology or the, of, of x tilde, is the same as that of x. So the, you, in some sense, don't lose anything by pulling back uh, from x to x tilde. But x tilde has the further virtue that it is actually an affine variety. And so what you can do, given a vector bundle on x, if you really have it in your heart that you want to put a connection on this bundle, you can pull it back to x tilde and put a connection there. That's not canonical. No, it's not canonical, but it's canonical up to, uh, up to stuff that typically you're willing to uh, uh, ignore. The connection, the bundle of connections, huh? uh, the bundle of connection, there is canonical connection, pathological connection. Well, there's no tautological x tilde, no. But uh, but once you once you pass there, then you can then you can. Why did you bond, find bond with all connection to point? Yeah. Then it's canonical connection. Okay. Well, then you then you could do that. Yes. But this is this not what you do. Well, you could if you want. That would I guess that would be affine. I'm not. You would maybe have to twist with a. Uh, but the, uh, the structure group is the affine group of the, of the fiber. Well, you see, that I, the reason I hesitate a little bit is one is reluctant to make x tilde depend upon the bundle. It, it's, it's perhaps preferable for purposes, which maybe I don't want to get into here, uh, it's perhaps preferable to choose x tilde depending on x, but not depending on, on the bundle E. Um, the, the obstruction that you described is just a curvature, right? I mean, it can be good as being a curvature. Well, it's, uh, I, I want to be in the algebraic category here. Uh, so it's the obstruction to putting an algebraic connection. If you, you like, you can get the curvature from this, uh, from this guy, but it is the obstruction precisely to doing that, to writing down a connection whose entries, if you like, are algebraic functions. Okay.
So we start off with our variety and our bundle, and uh, we assume we have a connection, uh, nabla, uh, which is to be an algebraic connection. So nabla then locally, if we suppose, suppose for a minute that our bundle is trivial, algebraic. Oh, the bundle is trivial, so it's a direct sum of the structure sheaf n times. So then our connection we know corresponds to an n by n matrix of algebraic one forms. And so now we're just going to do the, uh, the, the Chern-Simons approach. Uh, we give ourselves an invariant polynomial uh, capital P uh, on, the, uh, on the Lie algebra of some degree R. And then the, their, uh, their idea enables us to write down uh, a, um, some sort of a polynomial in the entries of a polynomial in A and also DA, uh, which I call TP of A, which is a 2R minus 1 form, and uh, such that D of TP of A is the invariant polynomial applied to the curvature. So for example, if we take the case R equals 2 and we take P to be the trace, P of a matrix to be the trace of the square of the matrix, then we get the sort of familiar uh, shape for TP of A. It's the trace of A DA minus. Uh, we tend to do things differently. So we're, we're um, it's somehow a question of thinking of, of connections as acting on row vectors or column vectors. So the signs look a little strange. Uh, we get a minus 2 thirds A cubed. Um, OK, so that would be what uh, uh, the standard prescription would be uh, for a trivial bundle. But of course, uh, the bundles you're interested in typically are not trivial bundles, um, algebraically trivial. So what you do, you write x as a union of uh, open sets, ui, Zariski open sets now. Um, remember, we're, we're talking algebra. And you, you, you restrict your bundle to each ui, and uh, you arrange so that the ui are sufficiently uh, small, so the bundle is trivial. You choose a trivialization, and that enables you to write down local uh, connection matrices, which I've called ai, which I've called ai. Am I standing in somebody's way? Um, and then you see you face the interesting problem. And here is, is, uh, is where things uh, uh, start to look a bit bizarre. Uh, you would like, you have these primitives, TP of AI and TP of AJ. And you look at them on the common intersection, which I've written UIJ. And of course, you, you kind of would expect, well, that, that they should differ by, uh, notice that uh, I've called them A to I and A to J. And notice that D of A to I minus, D minus A to J is our invariant polynomial applied to the curvature for the AI matrix minus the same for the AJ matrix. And of course, because our polynomial is invariant, that th those two are going to agree. So this is going to be then a closed form. And so you expect, well, of course, it should be, should be an exact form. Uh-uh. It's not. Um, but the A to I's uh, have a sort of a curious property uh, that a to i minus a to j is Zariski locally exact. So here is the, uh, the comment that I made at the, at the beginning. Um, the Poincaré lemma is false. Um, it's still the case. Uh, things are not totally a disaster. It's still the case by a, an old theorem of Grothendieck um, that the the algebraic differential forms do calculate, suitably understood, the classical topological complex uh, cohomology of the, of the variety. Um, but the Poincaré lemma does not, does not hold. Um, so what that means is, what that means is that the, you can define these sheaves, which I've written script H with a little underline, 
is to be the kernel of d modulo the image of d in the piece place, and that's a non-trivial sheaf. It is, in fact, the sheaf, the Zariski sheaf, associated to the pre-sheaf, which sends any Zariski open set to its classical cohomology. And you see, unlike the classical case where if you go local, you, you've got a disk, you've got something contractible, contractible the, the cohomology is, is, uh, is trivial. Uh, in the Zariski uh, case, as you go local, you make things worse. The, 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 the cohomology gets much more uh, complicated, and so this script is a, is a rather interesting gadget. And I, I mention here an example because it's, it's, uh, it's the, in some sense, the example. Uh, if you write down, say you take the variety SLN, so the variety of, of matrices, n by n matrices of determinant one, and you write down the generic matrix, so that's the matrix with just sort of standard coordinate functions as entries, and you look at DG times G inverse, so that's a matrix of one forms, and you raise that to some odd power. And then you compute the trace of that, uh, that matrix. Then what you get is a form, a 2R minus 1 form, which is locally, the risky locally exact on SLN, but is not globally exact. Okay? So, what can we do going back to our our a to i and a to j, so remember the a to i and a to j, those were the, uh, put it back up on the screen for a minute here, the a to i and a to j were the local churn simons uh, gadgets, and we'd like somehow to glue them together to get a global section of some sheaf. So what we can say, because they are Zariski locally exact, we can glue them together to get a section of the sheaf, uh, where'd it go? A section which I've called here omega of P, E, and nabla, which is a section of the sheaf omega 2R minus 1 modulo D of omega 2R minus 2. And these guys will be our algebraic churn simons classes. So notice they are, they take values in a complex vector space. They are not C star gadgets. Um, I'll sketch a little bit later on how the whole theory of differential characters uh, admits an algebraic uh, analog. Um, but for the moment, let's just focus on, on these guys, which makes sense. Now, to give you a little feeling for uh, what's going on here, I've written down an exact sequence of sheaves. Uh, you can take here uh, these uh, 2R minus 1 forms modulo uh, locally exact, and there is a map D because locally exact forms are certainly closed. The Zariski topology is not all that bad, uh, and so you can apply D uh, to such a to a section of this sheaf, and you get a locally closed uh, 2R form. So this is a subsheaf of omega 2R, and of course the kernel uh, is exactly the sheaf that I called script H uh, earlier on. Okay, so for example, if you take P uh, to correspond uh, to the rth elementary symmetric function, by, what I mean by that is if you think of P as acting, hmm, it's a curious little fellow here. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <He's cute. laughs> uh, maybe there's a, it's a good thing this isn't a computer program. <laughs> um, anyway, P corresponding to the rth elementary symmetric function, by that I mean that if you think of P as acting on a diagonal matrix, it's just the rth elementary symmetric function of the diagonal entries. Um, then, if you take your section, suppose, for example, that my X was an affine variety. Uh, if you take your section that you've constructed, your omega, and you apply this map D to it, then you get a 2R form. Now, for an algebraic, an affine algebraic variety, uh, it, you can calculate its, uh, its complex cohomology by simply looking at the, 
the global sections of uh, the, the forms in various degrees, uh, in other words, any Durham class is represented by an algebraic differential form. And in fact, it will be the case that if you apply your D to this omega, then you will exactly get the class, or A class, representing the rth churn class. Now, of course, that's a very curious looking formula because you don't usually think of the rth churn class as being exact, right? Um, and it's not. But uh, the point is that this omega is not really a global form. If omega really lifted to a global 2r minus 1 form, uh, you'd be in big trouble. That is, you will, would have killed the, the churn class. But in general, it doesn't. It simply gives a form modulo locally exact. Mm -hmm. Well, repeat that question in about, the question was, where is the cycle information hidden? Repeat that question in about 20 minutes, OK? Because uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, not for the first, no, no, you're, you're going to see, repeat that question about a half an hour. <laughs> you guys are, are way ahead of me here. Obviously, differential geometries move at a much faster rate. And I'm really impressed with how fast uh, uh, people, in algebraic geometry, we tend to average about, I don't know, maybe five or ten slides an hour, something like that. But, so. OK. So anyway, we have these gadgets, the omega sub r. Uh, oh, I, I, did I explain that? No, to, omega sub r, I mean, it's just a shorthand if I take p to be the, the rth elementary symmetric function. So this is the guy, which is a sort of a primitive for the rth turn class. It's just a, is it out of, are we out of focus? How, what, any suggestions as to how to improve the situation? I could turn that knob, but it doesn't seem to do anything identifiable. Ah, OK. The whole machine is pointing to the right bit. Too far to the right. OK, so let's, let's uh, worse. <laughs> I think we've about optimized. I, I've just been reading about Newton's uh, experiments with uh, Newton did some very exp impressive experiments with optics, but I'm not up to that level. So, uh, if you can't see, just uh, make me say the words. Uh, say in words. This, this, for example, which looks a little obscure, is the global sections of the sheaf. Uh, so the remark is that if nabla is integrable, so in other words, if nabla is square to zero. Uh, then these, uh, these omega guys are still defined, even though uh, the, uh, the curvature is zero. And then uh, the condition, the turn simons condition, just say, exactly says that they, they are, in fact, uh, closed. So you actually get a section, then, of this sheaf 2r minus 1. OK, so what, what does this mean? Well, um, I want to suggest a, a, a point of view about this, which, which goes back to work of Grothendieck uh, many, many years ago. Um, you see, we, we have two topologies here. We have the classical topology on our x, which is taken to be a complex algebraic variety. We also have the Zariski topology. And of course, you can think of the identity map as sort of a continu continuous map, because any Zariski open set is, in particular, uh, classically open set. And so you can compute. Um, <laughs> that looks like a different kind. We seem to have a whole little, a whole little menagerie in here. <laughs> okay. It's like when the dog runs out in the field in the football game. Okay. Anyway, uh, he seems to be more interested in the. I don't, I, there's this orientation. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I think you people have fleas here. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, by by analyzing, by by calculating, we'd like to calculate in the classical topology. Okay. 
I'm serious now. Uh, we'd like to calculate the cohomology of X in the classical topology, and we can do that via a spectral sequence by first taking the higher derived images of this identity map, which I've called alpha, and that leads us to a spectral sequence, uh, which is HP for the Zariski topology, with coefficients in this sheaf H or R, the higher derived image of uh, this uh, alpha lower star, which converges to the uh, classical Durham uh, cohomology uh, of, that we're interested in. And the remark is, of course, that this RQ alpha lower star of C is no more nor less than that script H uh, that I mentioned before. Because remember, the script H, the script H was the sheaf associated to the pre-sheaf, which sent an open set to its p cohomology. And that's exactly the prescription for writing down this uh, somewhat more elaborate looking RQ alpha lower star. So we get a spectral sequence whose E2 terms look like HP uh, with coefficients in the sheaf HQ. Well, our churn simons class, assuming that we started with an integrable bundle, with a bundle with an integral connection, our churn simons class is therefore a class in E2, 0, 2R minus 1. Okay. So now, this is kind of uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, development. I, I should have put one more, one more little arrow. Let me stand in front of the thing for a minute and put one more little arrow here. Here we have H Q of X C mapping to there. So we've defined now a characteristic class which is, lies in a vector space which receives the, so it's a, a complex vector space, it receives the qth cohomology uh, of x. It is in general strictly bigger, in fact it is in general infinite dimensional, this vector space. It's strictly bigger, uh, but on the other hand it maps to the Qth cohomology of the function field. So that's a, that's a kind of a game that people haven't played in many, many, many years, but if you look way back to uh, the 19th century, um, very frequently differential equations were, were expressed in terms of, of functions without regard to the zeros and poles of, of the functions. They were expressed in terms of meromorphic functions, and that's exactly what I mean here. I mean simply calculate the Durham cohomology of, uh, of the, the, the function field. So it's a, some sort of limit of Durham cohomologies of open sets. And in fact, what you get is a class in, in here, and it, it, you do not lose information by going to here. It's injective, the map. And what's more, you can characterize the image as being those guys uh, in the Durham cohomology of the generic point, which have no residue. So at all the co-dimension one points, if you have a Durham class, you can take its residue. And the requirement simply is that the residue be zero. So we get then characteristic classes for flat bundles uh, in there. OK. Um, now, there's one other interesting aspect, and this, this uh, uh, bears on the question where the algebraic cycles are. Um, another piece of the spectral sequence is the HP sheaf H is the HP sheaf H, so the E2PP part uh, of this spectral sequence. And it's a, it's a theorem that that, in fact, is given by algebraic cycles. So I've written here AP of X tensor C. It's the algebraic cycles of codimension P uh, modulo something called algebraic equivalence, which I think I won't, I won't uh, say any more about. Uh, it's a certain equivalence relation, a sort of a natural equivalence relation on algebraic cycles. Uh, tensored, of course, with the complex numbers, simply because I've chosen to work over the, uh, over the complex uh, numbers here. So everything vector space. And then another nice uh, important technical fact is that the cohomology of this sheaf HP vanishes in degrees above P. Or I guess I've written it sheaf HQ. So in other words, HP of sheaf HQ is zero if P is bigger than Q. Now you put these facts together 
And uh, you start to see how you can hope to link these characteristic classes with algebraic cycles. So for purposes of time, I've just written down the case for codimension 2, uh, which is sort of prototypical, but involves uh, less spectral sequence analysis than the other, uh, than the other cases. So let's just focus, focus on the case of codimension 2. Uh, this is really a disaster. This thing seems to go more and more out of focus. It's totally out of focus. Is that better? OK. So anyway, um, just by way of example, let's think about the case of codimension 2. Um, we consider the third cohomology of our variety. That's, that's a guy we can all uh, identify with. Uh, he maps to these global sections of sheaf H3. And that map, you see, is no mystery at all. Because after all, if I have a global cohomology class, I can restrict it to any open set and get a cohomology class on that open set. So I get, by sort of an obvious construction, a map to the global sections. Now, that map is not going to be injective. There will be certain cohomology classes. And here we start to see what's called the Conevo filtration, which is precisely the, defined in this kind of way as uh, classes which die on suitable open sets. Uh, so there's a, an N1, which is a subspace of the third cohomology, which dies when I do this game. Uh, but typically, the most interesting classes are the ones that live. And then the point is that you actually get the, 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 the theory tells you more. You actually get an exact sequence with a very mysterious map uh, going from the global sections of sheaf H3 to H2 sheaf H2. It's a map that just comes out of the spectral sequence. I and mean, then you can, you can say more. But, but as a first approximation, you can just think of it as a formal consequence of the spectral sequence. And this H2 sheaf H2 are the codimension 2 algebraic cycles. And then finally, uh, the image there is the kernel of the map uh, to H4 of X. C, which map you can think of as taking an algebraic cycle and associating to it its cohomology class. OK. So um, now, if we have a bundle with a, an integrable connection, then we saw it gives us a churn Simons class here. It also gives us a churn class. So maybe I should, let's see, did I write this? Yeah, I wrote it down here. So let's just uh, rewrite this exact sequence in a somewhat simpler form. A 0 goes to H3 modulo N1, goes to this global sheaf H3 guy, goes to something I call the Griffiths group. Now, if you look here, what's the Griffiths group? Well, uh, it's the algebraic cycles modulo algebraic equivalents, which die whose cohomology classes are 0. So it's the kernel, in other words, of this map. And I call that the, the Griffiths group. Now, in algebraic geometry, see, in topology, if you have a flat bundle, of course, uh, you know its churn classes, at least, are, are at best, they're torsion, and usually they're 0. Uh, but in algebraic geometry, we can talk about churn classes in the Chow group. And that's certainly no longer true. So you have a churn class in the Chow group. In particular, you have a churn class in this, uh, in this Griffiths group, in, the, in this uh, group of cycles modulo algebraic equivalents. But we know by churn bay theory that it dies in, uh, in the ordinary cohomology, so it sits in the kernel. So we have a class here. And then we have the class that we constructed using the churn Simons here. And the first thing that you verify is, in fact, that it's compatible. That is, the churn Simons class maps uh, to the churn class. But uh, which version of algebraic equivalence? Yeah, yeah. There's only one notion of algebraic. Uh, as only, uh, uh, yeah. you, you don't work in the original X with the final rise. Right? All this happens with the final rise. Right? No, uh, you can work anywhere you want. But uh, I guess when I started talking about, yeah, so there's kind of two places. Uh, I, I guess I kind of changed, uh, uh, changed up on you here. When I started talking about bundles with interval connections, uh, this uh, you can look anywhere you want, uh, but this is a theory which has interest even for compact varieties. 
right? So there are two ways you can think about connections. So you can compact if you uncouple with all the cycles and everything. Or you, uh, you can do also on open varieties. There's no problem. In fact, the, the construction that I sketched uh, doesn't change the Chow group. So in fact, you can, uh, you can work with the uh, Chow group for <coughs> open varieties. All this is OK. But, but uh, it's a good question, because I think that philosophically, maybe one should think at this point uh, about investigating uh, bundles with interval connections uh, on compact varieties, for example. But anyway, the, the point that I want to make about this thing before, before going on um, is the theorem is the following, uh, that if we start with an integral connection, then, then the, the rth uh, turn simons class in this algebraic sense is 0, if and only if the rth churn uh, class is 0 in the Griffiths group uh, tensor q. And now here, uh, your question is relevant because if r is bigger than 2, uh, the Griffiths group is defined modulo a, a, a variant on algebraic equivalence, which I maybe won't, won't go into, but there is in any case. So, um, so uh, to end this part of the talk, let me end with just a simple example. Um, because, of course, this theorem raises an obvious question uh, of the sort of, well, is it or isn't it kind of. Um, are these classes identically zero? Have you you know, have I been wasting your time for the last half hour with something which is, in fact, identically zero? Well, it's quite possible. Uh, this would be extremely interesting because here's, a, here's an example to sort of bring it home to you. Suppose that I have uh, an SL2 bundle uh, on a compact variety with an integral connection. So if you like, I have some representation of pi 1. Uh, uh, some SL2 representation of pi 1. Then I just take some open set over which uh, some non-empty open set over which the bundle is trivial, uh, and I write down the connection matrix. Okay? Then you easily verify up to a constant, which changes every time I do the ca calculation, but uh, it's, it's in any case, it's never been 0, so it's a non-zero constant, um, uh, that the, that the churn simons class is minus 2 uh, alpha wedge d alpha. Question, is this always exact? Now remember, we're in the algebraic category here. These are algebraic differential forms. Uh, is, is for any compact variety, any such, any time we have a situation like this, is that class always exact? I, I, I don't know, but uh, it's equivalent to um, the structure of the churn class um, in the Griffiths group. Okay, so let me let me go on now. Um, I now want to talk about Riemann rock theory for these classes. Um, you're gonna have a focus problem, don't we? So we give ourselves a relative situation. Uh, a smooth proper morphism, I mean, in fact, the theory is more general, but just to keep it simple, a smooth proper morphism from x uh, to s, and a vector bundle E uh, with a connection nabla on, on x. And uh, now I, I, I want to place myself sort of firmly in the middle between uh, general connection and uh, um, uh, integrable connection. Uh, if I say integral connection, uh, then then the theory is difficult to control in the sense that we don't have too many examples. Uh, so what I say instead is a, I assume that the connection has vertical curvature. So that means that when I look at the curvature, uh, the curvature matrix, if you like, is pulled up from, from, from S. Okay. Then you uh, can easily uh, verify that the cohomology sheaves if I take E and I couple it, because it has a connection, I can couple it to the Durham complex, to the relative Durham complex of x over s. Now be careful here. I assume that E has an absolute connection. But I only couple E to the relative Durham complex. And I then can take the cohomology, the hypercohomology of that, uh, of that uh, complex of sheaves, 
and you verify that the, that the, the cohomology sheaves down on S of that complex uh, have themselves connections, which is classically the Gauss-Menin construction uh, for, for connections. And the example um, is that if, 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 if E, for example, uh, has an integral connection, then all this machinery applies. And the, the, the simplest but not totally trivial example it would just be to take E to be the, the, the structure sheet with, the, with the, the trivial connection. And then, of course, you can say analytically that if you take the analytic cohomology along the fibers uh, with complex coefficients, and tensor that with the sheaf of analytic functions on S, then you get this guy, sort of the analyticification of these uh, cohomology sheaves. And the, right, the left-hand side of that isomorphism makes it clear uh, how the connection should work. It's just these are the horizontal sections here, and I tensor with, with functions. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, fiber-wise flat, I assume the curvature is vertical. Now, is it zero or is it just fiber-wise flat? I assume exactly what I say, that, that if I take nabla squared, that that actually sits in the pullback from the base, which is contained in the two forms on the, on the total space. OK. so. Um, the problem then becomes we would like to relate these algebraic Chern Simons classes for our bundle upstairs to the algebraic Chern Simons classes we could define for these uh, cohomology sheaves with their uh, Gauss Menin connection. Okay. Now, I've chosen to, uh, to mention here. Um, And I'm not sure why I put it here on the slide, but since I put it here, let me let me uh, talk. As the trouble with these slides is that you, when you give a talk, you you find yourself constrained to say exactly what you thought was clever to say the night before. Um, anyway, there are um, these AD classes which were defined by uh, Eno, and which are are much better. They are much finer uh, than the Chern-Simons classes. Uh, with all due respect to, to Chern and Simons, uh, the relation, the AD classes, well, I mean, in a sense, the AD classes are the true uh, algebraic Chern Simons classes. They take values in a, in a uh, hypercohomology, how am I doing here? In the hypercohomology of a certain uh, complex, uh, which begins with the Arth Milner K sheaf. So this is a certain sheaf uh, uh, generated by uh, symbols, that is, R tuples of uh, invertible functions uh, on the variety. And the D log map sends an R tuple of invertible functions to the evident uh, differential uh, R form. Uh, the hypercohomology in degree R um, of this uh, complex is the true algebraic generalization of the Chern-Simons forms in the sense that the integral, the integral condition that one, the, the sort of the differential character condition uh, becomes the, the condition uh, interpreted in terms of the, the K groups, uh, sort of an, uh, the sort of locally algebraic cycle condition. Um, but you notice that this complex, uh, in the end, uh, you can, there's a map from this complex to the 2R minus 1 forms modulo exact. So we have this kind of map. Oh, now I see why I put it here. Yes, because we have this kind of map when R is at least 2. Uh, but somebody, Ezra, somebody commented earlier that it didn't seem to make so much sense what I was saying when R was 1. Uh, and indeed, we have to change the definition when R is 1 uh, because uh, when R is 1, we have to go to omega 1 modulo the, uh, instead of modulo all exact forms, we take only modulo the logarithmic uh, forms. Um, so these AD classes are much finer. Unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot prove a Riemann-Roch theorem. 
If we could prove a Riemann rock theorem, uh, that would uh, give an algebraic proof of the uh, Riemann rock for Chern Simons as proven by Bismuth and by, by Lott. Um, but at the moment, we have uh, only uh, Riemann rock uh, for these uh, somewhat coarser uh, invariants. Um, the, in degree one, these invariants uh, capture the determinant. Actually, uh, the class here actually determines the determinant. If you think about algebraically uh, what it means to have a line bundle with a connection, uh, it's exactly determined by a class in H0 uh, in, this, in this way. So that, as usual, in this kind of characteristic class game, for degree one, you get all the information. It's only in higher degrees that you lose information. OK. So you know, let's go a little further here. Right. So I've chosen to add a little bit of um, extra information here. It's a little rigid to assume that the map is smooth. Uh, it's better to work in what's called a normal crossings uh, situation. Let me not get too tangled up with that. Uh, we consider a map. Uh, which you can take to be smooth if you like, uh, but is more general, uh, with fiber dimension d. And we consider a bundle um, with a connection which has vertical curvature. It's a bundle upstairs, that is on x, which has vertical curvature and which, whose connection has possibly logarithmic poles along uh, some normal crossing divisor. And then, we work with uh, the, what are called the Newton classes, which are the, um, so I write n omega r. They're the omega, the Chern-Simons classes associated to the invariant polynomial, which is just the trace of the rth power. And finally, I write e tilde to be the virtual bundle, which is e minus the rank of e times the, the trivial uh, bundle with trivial connection. And then the, Chern, the uh, riemann rock theorem says that the uh, chern simons class uh, downstairs, so here I've written Durham cohomology. This I, I seem to have changed notation. This I wrote ri uh, f lower star in the earlier page. So this is sort of the Durham cohomology coupled with this bundle E with this gauss menin connection is equal to minus 1 to the fiber degree times the direct image in a suitable sense that maybe I won't say more about of CD. So D remembers the fiber dimension. So this is a certain, certain churn class of omega 1 x over s. This is sort of like an Euler class, the top, top degree churn class. Um, this res y here uh, reflects the fact that I've permitted myself to have logarithmic poles. So I have to, in a certain sense, rigidify the situation. Again, as a first approximation, you can ignore that. You take the Chern class, you restrict, you take the, the, uh, the Newton Chern Simons class upstairs, restrict it to, uh, to this D Chern class, and then push down to get a class downstairs. So the, the riemann rock theorem says that those two are equal. Now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of riemann rock theorem that no, doesn't work for all the bundles, right? Because I, I've had to take something of virtual degree 0. That's the effect of putting this tilde here. On the other hand, it's an integral theorem. Notice that the, that the classes here for p, at least 2, are in vector spaces. But for p equals 1, it's a, it's a precise integral result. Um, the, you may ask to complete this theorem, what happens if I take the trivial sheaf, so something not of virtual degree 0, uh, then the higher ones, for p at least 2, are 0, and 2 times the first one is 0. The, the first class is just the determinant, is basically, I mean, is precisely the data of the determinant of the Durham cohomology. And so, for example, if we look at the first class, the determinant of the Durham cohomology, so to speak, divided by the determinant with trivial 
for the trivial sheaf, uh, tensor to the rank E times, is given by the direct image of the determinant upstairs times this, uh, oh, this should be CD, I'm sorry. I've reversed, this should be a CD and omega one, sorry. Uh, all right. So, you see, There's much work uh, still to be done because we would like to define the Riemann rock um, for the more powerful AD classes. But in any case, for the determinant, this gives a precise, a precise result. It precisely tells you. Now, notice this is kind of an interesting Riemann rock theorem because the usual Riemann rock theorem mixes degrees. You have a Todd class which sits in various degrees. And you have a, 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 churn, um, a churn form, which sits in various degrees, and you multiply them together, and there's sort of a, a mixing of degrees. Here, there's no mixing of degrees at all. You get the Peeth fellow upstairs uh, mapping to the Peeth uh, fellow downstairs. Uh, that's exactly what we knew to expect from the work of Wismut and, and Lott. Um, so finally, a few remarks. Um, this kind of Riemann rock theorem is, 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 of course, refines the degree zero Riemann rock theorem, which is just the, I guess, the Gauss Bonnet theorem, which simply says that the, uh, well, it's a little fancy because we've put in a, a twisted sheaf here, but but that really doesn't change anything. Uh, it says that the Euler class is just the rank uh, times the degree of the uh, of the top uh, uh, Chern class, just says the Euler characteristics, so the alternating sum of the degrees. Uh, but we're talking now about a, a refined uh, version of that, beginning with the determinant uh, and, and then looking at higher classes. Now, the problem of extending Riemann Rock uh, to the full AD classes, so I remind you those are classes with coefficients in a, in a, in a, in a complex, sort of in a hypercomology of a certain complex, is an interesting problem because uh, in some sense it's a problem very much of the same flavor as the original construction writing down uh, those primitives, the TP. Given a, um, given a matri uh, connection uh, matrix, uh, try to integrate the invariant polynomial applied to the curvature. But here it's a higher order problem because that integration, which I called A to I earlier on, gave you classes here, but now we need to write down a co-cycle in the full complex, so we need to walk back step by step um, and finally end up uh, with, with fellows which are not traditional differential geometric objects at all, but rather sections uh, in, this, in this K group. Uh, now, a word of warning if, before you set out to try to do this. It, it's not enough. The construction of the, of the TPs were just involved certain universal polynomials in the connection matrix and D of the connection matrix. But this, in this case, you have to uh, also integrate uh, the trace of uh, DG times G inverse uh, raised to some odd power. And as I told you earlier on, you can only do that Zariski locally. So you need somehow to combine this Zariski local idea, which is very much essentially the motivic cohomology of GLN or SLN uh, with the Chern Simons idea uh, in order to write down the full cocycle. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a doable and interesting problem. Uh, another interesting geometric problem. Um, concerns the determinant, I, I, it's the determinant, I call it NW1, but it's the same as the determinant, of the cohomology with, with, uh, with trivial. So this just means look at uh, a fibration, look at the Durham cohomology of the fibers, take its determinant. Now, suppose that your fibration degenerates. So that's on a base S, but suppose your fibration degenerates over some closed subset T contained in S. Then you will have some monodromy and the determinant class can be interpreted as a class in H1 
of s minus t with z mod 2 coefficients. Uh, the problem I want to mention is to try to give a formula for the residue of this class along, uh, along t. So I've drawn a picture here where x and s is a, a curve, let's say, and uh, the fiber. Actually, the picture is not realistic. Uh, this, uh, this class will be 0 if the fiber is odd dimensional. So you, the fiber has to be even dimensional to get anything interesting. Um, but you would like to give a formula for the residue along t of this class uh, in terms of the geometry of the degeneration. And one final question, which I want to take advantage of the fact here there, that I'm not swimming in the familiar waters, uh, to raise a question that perhaps somebody in the audience has some comment about, uh, of a slightly technical nature, but somehow it interests me. Uh, in the proof, in proving the Riemann rock, uh, we encounter equations of the following shape. You take a matrix of function, and you write DMI, a collection of matrices, a finite collection, you write DMI as being something sort of in lax uh, form, a sort of a commutator of a matrix. Uh, so phi here is a matrix of one forms uh, com commuted with, uh, with MI. So that would be sort of a lax equation if I ended there. But then there's a sort of a, a correction term, which is a sum of commutators times differential forms, so, which happen to be of the form D log AI minus AJ. So certain logarithmic one forms um, associated to the, the geometry. Uh, and I'd just be interested if anybody had ever encountered a, a, such a sort of nonlinear lax equations or, or if they were familiar. OK. Are there any um, questions? Do you have any examples for these originals? The first uh, Tertimus class in your situation came out on zero? So, so the, the, the question was, do we have any examples where these classes come out non-zero? The answer is yes and no. Uh, uh, the, the, the good news is that you can write down examples. Um, the bad news is that they involve uh, logarithmic poles. That is to say, they are not on compact varieties. They involve connections with logarithmic poles. Uh, it's not at all clear. It's quite possible that uh, these classes are identically zero. But that would be a very, very interesting result in its, in, in, in its own right. So I, I don't know. In any case, I should mention with regard to Riemann rock that certainly the determinant classes are not zero. So the, the, the content of the whole hour has not been identically zero. Yeah, but going close to the, to the uh, more classical Tertimus classes. Right. Well, these are classical, right. Uh, there's a lot of content in the open in the context of open varieties and log poles. Uh, in the closed variety case, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question is, what does Reznikov's theorem on vanishing uh, of, of certain classes have to do with this? And the answer is that, if you recall, the, the theorem I stated was that uh, the certain algebraic Chern class vanished in the Griffiths group if and only if a certain algebraic Chern Simons class vanished. And that, in the proof of that theorem, we use Reznikov's theorem. Reznikov's theorem essentially helps us to control the Hodge type of these Chern Simons classes. So. Are there other questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker.